a welcome to everybody, whether you be in the UK or in the warmest South Africa. A th thorough welcome to everybody, wherever you are. So this afternoon, we're in for a treat with Chris Harmon. Now, if there was ever anybody who needs no introduction, it's Chris. He's a very senior and respected philatelist. He's a signatory to the role of distinguished philatelists. He's a senior international judge. He's a leader of the RPSL expert committee. And most importantly, uh, for the purposes of this uh, presentation, he's also a recognized expert in Perkins Bacon who had, of course, premises in the city of London. So after that introduction, Chris, over to you, sir. Yes, I don't know how many people knew that the city of London had its own revenue stamps, but they did um, for uh, quite, uh, quite a long period, in fact, although we, it's, we're still discovering how long that period is. The title page here shows the arms of the city of London, uh, the George Cross, uh, the helmet on the top, uh, Domineno dirige nos, which means the, may the Lord direct us, and the two dragons are holding the uh, the shield in the middle. So um, that I that I got off the internet, and I think it's a rather magnificent one. And you will see, in particular, if you come come into the city of London, on the edges of it, you will see. Um, sort of statuettes, if you like, of the dragons uh, on the side of the wall, uh, on, the, on the road, um, to which, which uh, looking outwards, presumably defending the city. I thought it was useful to look at some of the background of uh, the city itself and how it's, how it's um, organised, because that is bound up with the revenue stamps themselves. Um, from very ancient times, it has been um, an organization of the of, uh, various citizens and freemen. Um, today, known as a square mile, the original city was within the walls of the city of London, which pre predate medieval times. Uh, the stamps themselves came into being in the late 1860s, and uh, the story I'll pick up that one a little bit later. This is the headquarters of the City of London, the Guildhall. Um, for those members who are going to attend the President's Dinner in February this year during London 2022, uh, the Guildhall is where the President's Dinner is being held and where the award ceremony for London 2022 is being held. So that, that's, a, that's a print of it going back to the early 19th century. And it is, it is def definitely still recognisable today as such. The other significant building within the Corporation of London and the organisation is the Mansion House. Uh, this is on the junction of Bank, so is literally a quarter of a mile around the corner from the Royal Philatelic Society. And it is the residence, the formal residence of the mayor of the, the Lord Mayor of London. London has two mayors. It has the mayor of London, which is the, the vast city that uh, goes 30, 40 miles in, in circumference. And it has the Lord Mayor of the City of London. And this is the Lord Mayor of the City of London. And the building is very much uh, similar today as you see it there. Although obviously the horses are now cars. The justice rooms, which is where much of the action and use of these stamps, there is a justice room in the Guild Hall. This is a new justice room that was built in the Mansion House. And uh, this comes from the Illustrated London News of, of about 1849 on that. The city itself is made up of wards and each ward elects an alderman, and the alderman sat in the court of um, the, the city to uh, hear disputes and settle, settle matters, um, mostly, mostly contract matters, and hence the 
the sort of the, le the legalistic um, aspects of trade within the city. This is these show the various wards within the city. I have highlighted the Royal Philatelic Society, which is in the Candlewick Ward, which um, uh, so that's indicated there. This goes basically on the right, on the east side, you get the Tower, the Tower of London, and on the uh, west side, Farringdon without, basically goes up to the law courts at the far end of Fleet Street. Uh, you'll see the wall itself is really this bit here, and therefore you get things like Aldersgate, Cripplegate, Old gate, which are always uh, the old gates of the walled city itself. And you get within there your things like things like Bishop's Gate without and Bishop's Gate within. Or Bishop's Gate within was within the wall, Bishop's Gate without, without is outside the wall. I thought it might be interesting just to see the map of what was actually destroyed in 1666. Uh, the fire started very close to where the Royal Philatelic Society now lives. Uh, the, monu the monument is still there, and there's an there's a, a, um, underground station at Monument. And um, so that shows the starting point of that. And it swept westwards right into Fleet Street, and so destroyed a very, very significant part of, of the city itself. Um, and uh, so almost all of that is rebuilt, very little, very little uh, survived. St Paul's Cathedral, as we see it today, is, is new, so it was built after the fire. The church next door to the Royal Philatelic Society is also new and was built by Sir Christopher Wren just before he took on the St Paul's Cathedral. Um, uh, the, the building of that. Also within the city, the printers who printed the stamps that I'm just going to take you through uh, today, and that is Perkins Bacon and Company, various names, um, I'm calling them Perkins Bacon here. This magnificent document is, was printed by them for the, for the Chicago exhibition, Columbian exhibition in 1893 with a, the old portrait of Queen Victoria on it. Then in fact they were an American company, they had arrived in London in 1819 with the avowed um, goal of pr printing banknotes of the Bank of England. Now, when you consider that, that actually um, England and France had been at war in the Napoleonic Wars, and basically the Americans are on the French side, the idea of an American company coming across to the UK and uh, being given the Bank of England banknote contract was possibly a bit far-fetched, but they didn't get it. But they were based in, in London and uh, until they, the company itself was dissolved in 1935. They were major banknote printers. They also printed for the British government. The first one was the playing card duty in 1828. And of course, as we know, they printed the penny black and tuppenny blue and continued printing British stamps until they lost the low value contracts in 1879. Here's just some examples of some of the things that they did. They were very well connected with many of the great engravers and designers of the time. The design at the top of that banknote was Henry he Edward Henry Cobalt, who designed a lot of stuff for Perkins Bacon. And the very attractive uh, stamps at the bottom are revenue stamps for life policy, issued in 1853. They used exactly the same head as the penny black. Uh, when you look at them in this big format, they don't look the same, but I can assure you they are exactly the same. Uh, most of the time Perkins Bacon did not duplicate uh, portraits. They took one master and they used that time and time again for other designs. The City of London was also the focus of the of philately in uh, the sort of second half of the 19th century before it moved a bit west towards uh, the Strand and that sort of area. And this is in fact a, a label printed by uh, Perkins Bacon for Hamilton Smith, who were in Bishopsgate, Bishopsgate within, so within the wall. And this bicolored label was, was printed by them. Hamilton Smith shortly afterwards in about 1905, in fact, was taken over by Stanley Gibbons. 
but these I think are, 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 are pretty things and are very much involved with the City of London. Perkins Bacon themselves went, were put into liquidation in 1935, but another company arose from the ashes of um, the original company, the one that had arrived in 1819. Uh, in fact, one of the directors of Perkins Bacon Limited, as they were at that stage, was a John Hubbard. And John Hubbard is a past president of the Royal Philatelic Society had very, very fine collections of things like Salon, Nicaragua, and like many of those old time collectors had a whole swathe of different, different um, countries that they collected. And as you see, uh, Perkins Bacon Limited was actually situated at number 22 at Church Lane. So uh, again, uh, the Royal Philatelic Society is, is very close uh, to the history of, of the people who printed the stamps we're going to look at here. Just uh, in slightly uh, more context of that, um, Lombard Street, of course, was the general post office. Lombard Street is just almost at the end of Abchurch Lane. And for those who collect early, early material, the Corsini House is in fact on the corner of what was then Fanchurch Street and Gracious Street, which is now Fenchurch Street and Gracechurch Street, um, the corner, the, the corner closest to the Royal Philatelic Society was in fact the residence of the Corsini family from when they arrived in the late 16th century until they left in 1635. Um, obviously we all have seen parts of the Corsini correspondence, they were uh, major traders across um, uh, across the Europe, across Europe, and um, uh, this, of course, was a huge correspondence. And the reason it survived was that they went back to Florence before uh, the Great Fire of London. All other correspondences basically were destroyed, and so hence, hence the survival of that. Uh, the stamps themselves. Um, there's basically three different designs here. One is the justice room, then the mayor's court, and a strange thing called the Guildhall consultation fee. And I'll talk about those basically in chronological order. Um, the justice room was the first one. It came in in 1871. Um, a bit later was the mayor's court, and for a very small period in the 1890s, this, this strange Guildhall consultation fee uh, came into being. These were printed by Perkins Bacon. And one of the interesting things is that um, I mentioned that, that the, the Queen's head tended to be recycled. So they took, they had one master die and they took roller impressions and put the head into various other designs. Uh, they did exactly the same with those background designs. And this rather magnificent um, document here, which is about a foot square, uh, it is, um, it, it, the uh, inscribed on it is Perkins, Fairman and Heath. Well, Perkins, Fairman and Heath was the name of Perkins Bacon uh, shortly after they arrived in the, U in the UK in 1819. So this document uh, dates to somewhere between 1819 and 1822. So it is a very, very early uh, document but they were still some 50 years later using these designs um, where they would take a roller impression from this master and put together the design for various stamps. This, this one you can trace um, several for, um, uh, I don't have to tell Mike Roberts that actually the one here, number, si number 16, um, here is in fact the uh, surround for the Pacific Steam Navigation Company. There's various other ones. Uh, there's a Bahamas background, there's a Grenada background, um, and various other ones there. So this is this is a this is a super super document. Obviously known as the 110 plate, as you would expect from when you look at it there. The two backgrounds that come into being for the for the City of London revenue stamps are number 11 um, in the middle there and 
number 23, the one with the one in it, which we use for two of the stamps there. The Royal Philatelic Society has the printer's archives of Perkins Baker, and therefore we know a lot about the making of plates, the engraving of dies, etc. And uh, these three stamps are clearly identified as uh, in terms of the drawing of the, of the design, the engraving and the finishing and the making of the plates. And so you get um, the, the early the early work in 1869 on the Justice Room, the final plate being um, finished on the 6th of October 1871, the Mayor's Court in the summer of 1880, and the Guildhall Consultation Fee in 1891, probably coming into use in 1892. This here is a um, die proof of the Justice Room and shows the background that was on the 110 plate on that. Um, one of the problems with the City of London stamps is that we, they've never really been studied in terms of being able to be allocated uh, particularly accurately in terms of date and when design changes happened. Um, there is a pretty, pretty wide agreement on what actually exists, uh, but not of the other detail that goes with it. Uh, the previous slide with, with um, the, the making of the plates is something that we didn't know until reasonably recently. Uh, but this particular one, that one of the problems is there's very few dated examples. Uh, occasionally the Justice Room has a dated obliteration, uh, but to my knowledge, no Guildhall Consultation Fee or Mayor's Court has ever been found with a date across it. Unless, of course, it's on an original document, which there are a number around, but they're not that common on that. And one of the things that I've been studying is whether you can actually, by looking at other parts of uh, other stamps, as to whether you can come to conclusions with some of the dating of these particular stamps. And I think I've, I think I've come to some pretty solid conclusions on that. Um, and... To il illustrate that, what I've got here are the, the red Justice Room stamps, which never have a value attached to them. Uh, not quite sure what they were there for, but I suspect if you look at revenue documents, you will often get a duplicate of a document where the original document will have paid the duty and therefore is stamped with the duty, um, typically on, on a blue on a blue escutcheon on the document itself, and a duplicate would have the same duties struck on a pink background escutcheon. And therefore proving that the duty had been paid, but not charged additional duty because the color would indicate that it was, it was not dutiable. And I suspect that these is, this is probably where these particular stamps are used, but that is speculation. But I think I think reasonably reasonably solid. One of the reasons I show these is because of the perforations, and it it is the perforations that I've used I think to to identify um, with pretty solid foundations the order of use of some of these. As you can see, one of them is dated. Uh, one of them is frustratingly only partially dated. But if you look at if you look at those uh, those five stamps, right? Um, the perforations you can relate back to the work that Perkins Bacon did on the British Empire stamps. There is a fantastic book, which is the original master book on Grenada, um, but it includes a section on the perforators of, of used by Perkins Bacon. Sir Edward Denny Bacon had access to the uh, perforating and printing records of, of Perkins Bacon at the turn of the 19th, 20th century. He had uh, direct conversations with Miss Stewart, who was the lady in charge of the perforating from 1860, when they started doing their own perforating, right up to the end of the 19th century. And she kept a record book of everything that she did. Uh, regrettably, that record book has gone missing. It was actually owned personally by Sir Edward Denny Bacon, and um, I had assumed it had been seen since then, certainly talking to Ronald Butler, I assumed he had seen it, but uh, he may not have seen it, but
but certainly we cannot find it and it is not part of the Perkins Bacon archives. So unless Nicola can tell me otherwise, I fear this is lost or at least mislaid in a fairly serious fashion. But what Sir Henry, Ed, Sir Henry Denny Bacon did was to look at the, the various perforators and uh, the original machine that they bought in 1860 was refurbished in 1872 and it's recognizable across most of the British Empire stamps and it gives a gauge of about 15 and which meshes in very well with an 1872 date for the first justice room stamps per 15. That same machine re was refurbished in 1880 and for at least 10 years had a gauge of 11 and a half. So that fits in pretty well with um, the, the attributing the perf 11 and a half that you find on these to about to about 1880 onwards. We know it was still in existence in 1890 because it was used for demonstrations at the London Philatelic Exhibition. Um, there was a mysterious perforation, perforation used for the stamps of Grenada in, in 1882. No, it wasn't a Perkins Bacon machine. It was probably um, outsourced by them or possibly outsourced by them and uh, had a gauge of about 14 and a quarter. It was only used for Grenada, nothing else, until I discovered actually it fits exactly. So the Grenada stamp and the, and the Perth 14 of the, of the Justice Room fits absolutely exactly. It is the same perforator. And therefore you've got a gain, you've got an 1882 um, date for that machine. Edward Denny Bacon lists a 12 and a half for one of a new machine that Perkins Bacon bought and, and in a after, and listed as being having a 12 and a half perforation in about 1895. And again, we have dates on those dated copies, put the perf 12 and a half at about 1895. Uh, that's I'm afraid where it runs out because um, there are some later perforations, um, almost certainly later anyway, which, which uh, we cannot attribute to a particular machine. By that time, I think Perkins Bacon had more and different machines. It is possible by looking at things like some of the Indian states or some of the South American countries, we may be able to add some greater certainty of those because that was the main work that they were doing at that stage. Now to the issued stamps. <laughs> um, the base colour of, of the stamps was black for the Justice Room and rather obscurely they overprinted them in a red, not very easily visible, uh, but um, it, 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 that, that carried on for really quite some time. Per 15, which means they're the earliest ones, 1872, and you see that um, I've illustrated at the top um, more, more than one more than one typeface used. Um, if you look very carefully you can probably find different typefaces but um, it'll probably send you mad in the progress in the process of that. Um, the highest values that are generally available are ten shillings and sixpence which you'll see the one on the bottom right. Um, there are some higher values up to 31 shillings and sixpence. I have only ever seen one copy um, and that the gentleman who owns that is in the audience and if he ever gets bored of it then he knows where it can go. Um, at about 1885, perf 11 and a half, so one's attributing it to roughly the right, right time frame, they made the values much much more easily readable. Again there was, there was more than one typeface, there's a big thick one with a wide O and there's a slimmer one uh, with narrow lettering and the examples there of the perf 11 and a half um, um, up, up to the 10 shilling and sixpence value. Uh, but all black stamps at that stage. Um, you would have thought it was logical actually for different valued stamps to have different colours so that they're more easily recognisable and they started that in about 1895. And this is a series of colour trials for the various values in the colours that, that they, they then adopted. So you've got, you've got the black for the shilling, the blue for the two shilling, for the red, red um, orange for the three shilling and the yellow orange for the for two and sixpence at the bottom. 
The one on the left, I can't quite, it doesn't seem to fit anything unless there's something like a 31 shilling and sixpence that none of us have ever seen, which was in purple, but I, I, I don't know. That's completely, complete guesswork. Um, the block in the center, which is rather pretty, with, is, is the Perkins Bacon specimens. As you can probably look, see if you look carefully, it's inverted and reversed on the top and upright on the bottom. That means they've been folded over and uh, punched once through a whole series of fold, folds of the, of the stamps. They've been folded horizontally. So these are the issued stamps in their new colors, starting in about 1895. The few dated examples seem to put them in that exact similar sort of place um, and the colors you've seen uh, before there. Later on, um, uh, same colors, same color schemes, uh, but they tended to use uh, brighter and more, more uh, visible uh, settings for the values. And there's various block letterings for this, there's various serif letterings, there's smaller, there's larger. There's a whole range of them that, that uh, fit into probably post about 1910, but uh, nobody knows exactly when. Um, these ones, I suspect probably remaindered because they are common unused when the other ones were, are very, very uncommon unused. More regularly than dated, you see actually see a perfin um, cancellation. And the top two are the justice room. As you can imagine, MHJR is Mansion House Justice Room and GJR is Guildhall Justice Room. When you come to the mayor's court stamps, which we get to next, uh, they use this cursive MC. There are uh, three different types of it. Uh, the early ones were the big holes, and then the later ones, the middle holes, and the later ones still the, the, the smallest holes on that. So, and I flip those so you can see them uh, better, and so you can compare. So here's the mayor's court completely different shape stamp, much squarer than the, than the justice room. These die proofs come out of the Marcus Samuel collection. Um, and I think the one on the left is probably unique without, without any of the lettering on it. Um, you would see occasionally the other one with, with the lettering in place. And again, the, um, that's what sort of one of the stock backgrounds. And this is a very nice representation of the uh, city of London arms. Uh, plate proofs on the left, so imperforate of the basic stamp without any value atta attached to it. Um, and again, uh, perforated specimens, as you can see, the specimen on the top is in inverted and reversed. And obviously the two were folded back on one another to, to, so that one strike went through several, several layers of stamps. Whether they did that with a whole sheet, I don't know, but they certainly did it with this block. Rather mysterious color trials. These, I don't think, probably have anything to do with the stamp and uh, selection of the color. The colors here are reminiscent of later um, reprints that Perkins Bacon did of a number of British colonial stamps. These very bright colors. Um, and so I don't know where they fit in. They're very attractive, but um, they are problematical in terms of the evolution of the design and the selection of, of the color, but they are definitely extremely uh, beautiful items. As always with color trials, you normally think uh, the colors that they didn't select are better than the ones that they did. But I think we see that with everything it's to do with familiarity. These are plate proofs with the value um, put on. So imperfect examples with which were used for um, sort of make readies or uh, practice runs to, as to where they're putting the values on the stamps themselves. And some examples there. The first issued stamps punctuated with the big holes, um, as you would expect with the first ones. Uh, they date to 1880. The Perth 14 
and a quarter, which is this mysterious Grenada perforation, which dates in exactly the right period of this. As I say, I've never ever seen a mayor's court dated other than on a document. Um, and so, and a strong, strong print of all of the values. Slightly woollier print, um, but of paler colors on this. This time a bit later on, uh, these ones are all per 11 and a half. So that, that puts them a little bit later. My guess is somewhere 1885, 1890. And um, with, the, with the smaller hole perforation, which again chimes in with the uh, about, about the right date. Occasionally, this stamp occurs on very blued paper. Um, it is not just blued by the inking, it is actually a blued paper. Uh, the basic color is very different from the from the white paper ones and I indicate there the uh, certainly the lower left one is is obviously very strongly blued on that. These are also quite worn printings. You're starting to see um, the, 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 the plate showing signs of wear or maybe just signs of not having been cleaned very well. But um, blue blue plates did seem to uh, wear quicker. The, the caustic nature of the blue ink, I think, tended to wear it quicker, and that is consistent across quite a lot of the Perkins Bacon work. Um, they changed the um, basis of value, rather like the Justice Room, from, from that to that. And again, there are different types of overprints that you see across, across it. Now, the interesting thing to me was that we seem to have gone back here to very, very well-defined um, stamps. So the wear that we seem to be there in the earlier one is now no longer present. Now, the obvious thing is they've made a new plate. Uh, there are no records that we can find so far that they ever did make a new plate at this stage. Maybe it was just, it was cleaned and therefore showing it slightly better than previously. So that, that really is covers Justice Room and a couple of documents to show how they used. Um, this is one um, you used in the Mansion House, the Justice Room that, um, and it is, a, it is a fee that for um, a, a notarized signature effectively. So, um, and so a document which was si signed off by the bottom by the, the alderman in, in one of, the, one of the, the weekly sessions. This is an interesting one, mainly because of who's, who, who's relate, who is um, uh, listed on it. Um, the plaintiff here was Herbert Sutton, seed merchant. Well, we all know Sutton seeds. They still exist to this day. And obviously they had, they had, I don't know who the Reverend Giles is. He obviously he had bought quite a lot of seeds, seven pound eight shillings and eight pence is a lot of seeds and was having trouble paying. And so anyway, he presumably did pay in the end and it cost him four shillings in, addis in addition from the, 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 fi the fee or fine um, for going through the city of London court. The, and mention this rather mysterious thing, the Guildhall consultation fee, which is a, uh, um, if you were going, if you were with your lawyer and you were going in front of one of the courts, you could hire a room to consult with your lawyer um, ahead of, ahead of um, attending the court itself. Um, for a very short period, probably about a year or not much more, um, a stamp was used to prove that you had paid the fee. The pay fee was two shillings and six pence. So the Guildhall consultation fee is you and your lawyer in a side room um, uh, doing some work and planning planning your what, what you were going to say to the court and you, it costs you two and sixpence to have that private room. Uh, the background here is the number 11 on the large, the large 110 sheet. And uh, the die proof on the right, I think is particularly nice because it's an early version of the die proof where it's still got the, the, the marks 
left and right to show the middle of the design itself. This I think is a is a most spectacular stamp. I, it's one it is one of my favourites, and um, very very pleased to have got these die proofs again. They were ex the Marcus Samuel collection, and um, uh, are not often seen at all. What was discovered uh, relatively recently was complete sheets of one of the colour trials, the orangey one and a, another partial sheet, much of it damaged, of the one in purple as well. And they came up at auction in London and I, I, I bought the sheets and broke them up. Um, so um, those are from the only, only one sheet and the only partial sheet in existence. Uh, specimen overprints, um, again, uh, this, this large block is, is quite unusual, uh, but uh, showing again, they, they had been folded over. They don't met, met, match exactly like the previous ones did. So obviously they didn't, they, these ones weren't folded back on themselves, but um, it is a typical Perkins Bacon uh, perfume overprint or perfume specimen. Probably the rarest single item in this display is this rather um, un, 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 what's the right word, sort of unspectacular um, document. It is the usage of the Guildhall consultation fee. I am aware of one other in the collection, and it does show that this, this is the receipt document saying I have paid my two and sixpence and yes I've got my private room and uh, that that came to me funny enough uh, somebody was at Stampex uh, bought it on the basis that I might like it I think they paid nothing for it I had to pay a bit more and was very very happy to do so but that's probably I'd say certainly one of two in existence I think. Um, Colour trials with a Guildhall consultation fee uh, beautiful trials. Uh, strangely, they're on watermark paper, watermark multiple rosettes. So when you when if you're a collector of Papua, Sarawak, etc., then you'll know the multiple uh, rosette watermark extremely well. No stamps, to my knowledge, were ever printed on this watermark paper by Perkins Bacon. They were De La Rue on the whole. Um, and but anyway, Perkins Bacon did use some of that paper for these um, bright coloured colour trials, almost certainly done after the stamp had, had been withdrawn, probably about 1900, which is the time when they started doing some of these um, sample, uh, reprint samples of that. And I think these probably fit in with that. Probably done with the die, not with the plate. They're all cut, uh, whilst they're perforated, they're cut uh, square as well. So I suspect they cut. They may have come from a sort of printer's sample sheet or something like that. But very pretty, very pretty, and ex the Marcus Samuel collection. These we do know about. These are uh, prints done for presentation purposes. The one on the left is a, is a presentation booklet done by Perkins Bacon, um, and shows the mayor, mayor's court in green on highly glazed paper. And ditto, the one on the right was uh, a Dickinson, John Dickinson, the papermakers, one of the uh, presentation books that, that Perkins Bacon made up for them. Uh, behind the, the screening of this, in fact, these I think are probably blocks of about 12 um, hidden by the screen. They were much bigger than you're seeing here. Last two items. Um, really to do with uh, looking at the when these stamps were used. Um, it's still somewhat controversial as to when they were uh, last used, but here is an example dated 1907 of a complaint from uh, the, on the mayor's court saying basically these stamps don't stick. And uh, with, with a pencil reply um, uh, from, from Perkins Bacon and, and the, final, uh, the final reply there. So definitely these stamps were still being used and complained about in 1907. So um, uh, 
can't go much later than that, but they were definitely there. The Justice Room, which most people say probably stopped using stamps in about 1920. Now, this is a complete plate proof sheet. On the reverse, it actually says final sheet, um, 61033, so 6th of October 1933. So undoubtedly these stamps were still being printed in October 1933. And if you look at the single on the right, frustratingly it hasn't got the complete date but it has got 1903 so 1930 something and it is the small type you find in these later stamps and therefore um, undoubtedly these justice room stamps were used well into the 1930s so that gives some indication of, of the sort of range of dates which uh, people have still been struggling with and that concludes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. Michael, back to you, Mike Roberts. Well, I thought the first thing we were going to have would be questions, Mark, before I concluded. I think we will. And the good news is we have a few. And the first one actually comes from Mike Roberts himself who asked, does the amount of 10 shillings and sixpence, or indeed any other amount, represent a fee for something specific? The answer is yes, it does. Um, and somewhere in the archives are the schedules of rating. We have a certain amount of them. They seem to have altered um, um, over the years and mostly once cross-checking documents yes so in theory we should be able to do it in practice uh, it's probably hidden in the guild hall somewhere because 10 and sixpence is a lot of money then isn't it 10 and sixpence is a lot of money 31 shillings and sixpence is even more mm. <coughs> yeah okay thank you very much moving on to the next question which comes to you from malcolm gascoigne he asked, did Perkins Bacon print all the duty aces, yes, so like the ace of spades, for the one shilling fee paid? Uh, sorry, the for the one, sorry, I misread the question. I'll, I'll read it again, sorry. Print all the duty aces for the one shilling fee period. I beg your pardon, I misread it. Um, I think the answer is yes. Uh, they produced an ace called old, they, it's normally called old frizzle which was, this was a time when um, the duty on a pack of cards moved from being on the wrapper to being on the ace of spades. And it was a shilling. Um, and uh, that went on until 1862, until it went back on the wrapper at 1862. Um, certainly Perkins Bacon did a lot of them. I'm not sure they did all of them. I have the book here and I cannot from memory uh, do that, um, but but they certainly did quite a wide range of them, including ones inscribed for other printers. So they um, they printed it. They were uh, authorised by the revenue to print the Ace of Spades for other printers, and in a way, I suppose that's logical, because they themselves, I don't think, printed playing cards at all. And if Delarue was doing playing cards, would you actually give Delarue? Uh, permission to print the duty on playing cards and print the playing cards themselves. It's sort of maybe too much in one place. Thank you. So, Frank, thank you. Frank Walton asks, are there any records that indicate the number of stamps printed? I think Frank can answer that one as well as I can. Um, uh, we hope that there might well be, but we haven't found that bit of the uh, Perkins Bacon archive yet. Certain, um, certainly on postage stamps, that is the case. I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be there, but uh, whether the records exist, we certainly haven't found them yet. So uh, one of the things Frank and I, I think, are going to be uh, digging around to try and find an answer to. Okay, thank you. And um, Derek Lambert, has a query regarding the document that you referred to. He asked whether it was been whether it had been notarized because he couldn't see the seal. Um, if it was, he was he says it's likely to be by a scrivener notary. Um, 
the answer is I think I was slightly sloppy in my language uh, in terms of notarized. I know exactly that. Um, and um, uh, we see these little most mostly um, young Jewish men who go around notarizing documents around the city and they turn up with all their equipment, etc, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, I think this this was a, 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 a confirmation of a signature. I don't think it was actually probably notarized. So I think I was a bit sloppy on the language. Thank you. Um, Frank is now asking another question. Um, the Guildhall colour trials that are on the Rosette paper, he asks, could these have been printed by De La Rue using the Perkins Bacon plates? He says this may complement the theory regarding the Irish revenues being printed by De La Rue in, this, in the later years. I think uh, no, this theory, which is I share with Frank regarding some of the Irish revenues in particular, um, I think the answer is it's unlikely because this was, if you like, a private um, agreement between the City of London and Perkins Bacon, who were, you know, very lived very close to one another. I think it's pretty unlikely. And actually, when you look at them, the coloration is more like the uh, reprinted proofs uh, and and printer sample sheets done by Perkins Bacon. Uh, for instance, uh, I have got um, a one of the printer's sample sheets on this rosette paper in a comparable colour to this, um, which has the Salon Foreign Bill, the Tasmania Van Diemen's Land, Penny, etc. on it. So I think these all relate to Perkins Bacon and not De La Rue. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of members are contributing some information here, Chris, which is relevant. Richard Moss has pointed out that 10 shillings and sixpence is half a guinea, whereas 31 shillings and sixpence is a guinea and a half. And he's missing the 21 shilling in the middle, yes. Indeed, which would be uh, a guinea. Yeah. <laughs> That's so right. Half, yeah, half, yeah. half one and one and a half, quite yeah. absolutely yeah. Yep. Ian Matheson. I would say English guineas, not Irish guineas, of course. Okay, yep important clarification right Ian Matheson has uh, explained that he has a dated power of attorney with one shilling large font signed by Sir Kiniston Stud Lord Mayor with a date stamp of the 9th of May 1929 it also bears GB and South African revenues so that's a bit of information there interesting Alan Holm asked the following question, Chris. He said, did the Chancery Courts and the stamps come under a higher or different authority? The authority of the City of London, it was basically its own, its own county court. And in 1971 was rolled in as just another part of the county court system. Um, so it was completely separate from the central courts like the Chancery Court, etc. So um, this was, this goes back to ancient times when the City of London basically had control of its, of its own um, day-to-day own -day matters through the Corporation of London, including disputes and legal um, issues uh, that arose within the city. Okay, thank you. Well, I believe, Mike and Chris, that that was the oh. last, oh. Um, okay, Derek's just providing an additional piece of information there about the different courts. He points out that the county court was called the Mayor's and City of London Court. That is correct. Yeah. This is, I think, what I've got written down there. Yeah, it was a, it was a naming thing. Yeah. Right. Anyway, that was the final question there. And um, I'd, like to hand, <coughs> I'd like to hand back to Mike at this point. <coughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you very much, Chris, for a wonderful and very professional presentation on a very interesting subject. Uh, it's, it's so different from a lot of the other topics we cover. And everybody should note, if they want to know how to do a proper Zoom presentation, you need to look no further. And it was a fantastic history lesson. So as you would expect, uh, everybody would expect, um, 
the research is exemplary. There was a great explanation of the background relevance to the city. Um, interestingly, going back to the Great Fire and a lot of detail, again, as I would have expected, knowing your expertise about Perkins Bacon and the various stamps. So we saw examples from the Justice Room, the Mayor's Court, um, Guildhall consultation fees, Perfins and some very interesting uses at the end. So Chris, thank you very much for a superb display. And I think that everybody has learned quite a lot. I certainly have. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand over to our president, uh, Peter, who will do a virtual presentation, I hope. Hello. Um, yes, a very good afternoon to everyone. And um, Mike, you couldn't have summed up uh, such a wonderful um, presentation this afternoon better. Um, I was thinking during a, a very long um, meeting this morning at which both Chris Harmon and Mike Roberts and one or two others who are on the scheme this afternoon were all morning. Um, that if you want a good job done by somebody, you find a busy man and uh, ask them. And uh, that's exactly the case with Chris Harmon. He's a very busy man. He's a very knowledgeable man, but he's a very generous man, both with his knowledge and with his time. And Chris, we thank you very, very much indeed for uh, your presentation. I was personally absolutely fascinated. As you know, I'm very interested in revenue stamps. And... Um, some of the references to um, the patterns that, that um, Perkins Bacon produced for various things like the um, uh, Salon Foreign Bill stamps and things like that, certainly close to my heart. So thank you very much indeed. Um, it was very kind of you also to spend time illustrating how the new Royal Building at 15 Abchurch Lane is absolutely and totally um, in the middle of everything you've been speaking about today. And uh, I'm sure that anyone online who hasn't been there needs to go. Uh, I hope also that apparently we have had some interest from non-members of the Royal to these um, presentations, these Zoom presentations. We've had a number of people say that they're interested in joining the Royal. And I do reiterate that anyone out there who is not a member, but who would like to know more about membership at the Royal, please um, drop a line. Um, go to the website rpsl.org.uk and you will find lots of data and we will be in touch with you. But my duty this afternoon, Chris, is to thank you very much indeed for your time, for, for a very interesting and happy afternoon for all of us, despite the wind and the rain, which is battering against my window as I speak, and to um, present you with a, a certificate, this time a digital certificate, uh, which I'm sure you will you will collect in due course um, from either from the Royal or from the Postman. So thank you, Chris. And here comes the certificate. Thank you very much. There you go. Much, I expect much you've got lots of them. Much of it. I ha do have a few, actually. Yes. Thank you. Good. Well, this one is very, very well deserved. And thank you for that. Well, thank, thank you, Peter. Uh, and thank you once again, Chris. As far as I'm concerned, that concludes the uh, formal part of the meeting. Uh, I think perhaps Mark keeps it open for a bit for casual chat. So with that, thank you very much to all um, and see you soon. <laughs>